Afternoon, everybody. Okay, a couple things at the top. On South Sudan, in response to the sudden and serious decline in the security situation in South Sudan, we released statements on the 9th and the 10th of July condemning the latest outbreak of violence and calling on President Kiir, First President, for, I'm sorry, First Vice President Mashar, and their political allies to immediately restrain their forces from fighting. Our ambassador, Ambassador Fee, has spoken repeatedly with senior officials on both sides, and today we welcome the presidential decree declaring a unilateral ceasefire to take effect at 6 o'clock. We also welcome the commitment conveyed by First Vice President Mashar to reciprocate uh, with a unilateral ceasefire for opposition forces. The United Nations Security Council, the African Union, and regional partners have been actively engaged in calling on the leaders in South Sudan to commit to the full and immediate implementation of the peace agreement, including the permanent ceasefire. We strongly urge that the two leaders do everything in their power to ensure these decrees will be fully respected and unfettered humanitarian assistance will be provided to those affected by the violence. I also want to add our condolences, thoughts, and prayers to all those who have been affected by the violence, the families of those killed, and of course those who have been wounded and, uh, and hurt. The Secretary remains, for his part, very engaged. He spoke uh, 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 yesterday with Prime Minister Haile Mayriam uh, uh, and President Kenyatta regarding a coordinated regional response uh, to the unrest. The UN Security Council yesterday discussed as well how to enhance the UN mission in South Sudan, otherwise known as UNMIS. I think you guys are familiar with that acronym. To better enable the mission to prevent and respond to violence, we are in active communication with partners on appropriate next steps. In addition, we are moving out on all fronts to reduce the number of staff by implementing an ordered departure from our post. That is our focus right now, an ordered departure. We are adjusting, or simply adjusting our footprint in response to the deterioration in the security situation. We are also in constant communication with U.S. citizens in Juba, and we released a travel warning yesterday evening. Protecting American citizens and ending the fighting are, are, remain our top priorities in South Sudan, and we are working closely with senior leaders, the African Union, and regional partners to do so. Uh, a note on Pakistan, uh, we are deeply saddened by the passing of Pakistani philanthropist Abdul Sadar Edi on uh, the 8th of July. One of the world's great humanitarians, Edi's compassion, dignity, and humility serve as an example to us all. He led a life dedicated uh, to serving others regardless of religion, class, nationality, or ethnicity. We offer our deepest condolences to his wife and his children, the millions that he personally touched, and of course to the people of Pakistan on this sad occasion. Finally, a programming note, uh, Secretary Kerry will travel uh, this week, uh, starting this week. He'll travel to Paris at the invitation of President Hollande uh, to attend Bastille Day celebrations. He will, uh, 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 the travel starts uh, Wednesday, the Bastille uh, Day celebrations are obviously on the 14th. Uh, later that evening on the 14th, he'll travel to Moscow uh, where he will begin a series of meetings with senior Russian officials to discuss Syria, Ukraine, Nagorno-Karabakh, among other issues. He'll then travel to Luxembourg City, Luxembourg, on the 15th of July, where he will meet with the, the Deputy Prime Minister foreign, and Foreign Minister, Gene Asselborn, to discuss a range of bilateral issues, the transatlantic relationship, and a variety of other issues of mutual interest to us both. The Secretary will then travel to Brussels uh, from July 17th to the 18th, where he will meet with EU member state foreign ministers and uh, EU High Representative Federica Mogherini, uh, ahead of the Foreign Affairs Council, uh, and there to discuss, of course, key foreign policy priorities uh, across the continent. Next, the Secretary will travel to London uh, on the 18th and the 19th, where he will attend multilateral meetings on Yemen and uh, on Syria. So, with that, Dave, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yes. Um Start with, uh, with South Sudan, since since you did. Uh, can you? What's the situation now in terms of the uh, departure of the uh, of the Americans uh, from your mission? Well, you know, we don't, uh, um, for security purposes, we don't detail uh, specific numbers. Uh, but the the uh, order departure is in place. It's not 
uh, an evacuation. Uh, it's an ordered departure, and, and uh, we're uh, working through um, affecting that uh, uh, even today. But I just don't have, and I won't have on a daily basis, any kind of an update. Staff in country. I beg your pardon. Is the end state everybody gone? No, it's an ordered departure, uh, a, a steady ordered departure of uh, uh, of staff. Um, uh, uh, so again, I don't, I just don't have an update for you. Okay. And is uh, our all U.S. personnel that you're aware of accounted for and safe? All chief of mission under people uh, uh, under people under the authority of the chief of mission have all been accounted for. Uh, uh, we obviously uh, are in touch with as best we can with uh, other American citizens who, who are in Juba. It's as you know difficult for us to say with 100 percent certainty that we know uh, of every American citizen that is there, uh, but we are uh, trying to stay in, in communication with them as best we can. And are you able to remain in communication with the two camps, with the, the president and we the have. vice president? Or? We have. Our ambassador has. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, I have some on Syria as well, but if anyone wants to continue. Anything more on South Sudan? I just want to make sure I understand. When you are through with the, when this ordered departure comes to an end, there will still be staff of some number at the embassy. Is that correct? It's a order departure. Uh, adjusting the footprint in response to the deterioration. I, I'm not going to be able to say with great specificity uh, what the end state of that's going to be in terms of presence there. Um, as I said uh, today, uh, we're not talking about evacuating the embassy. It's an ordered departure. Okay. Go ahead, so, uh, so Syria, the uh, Syrian army has renewed a 72-hour ceasefire that they themselves declared. Uh, obviously, uh, last week uh, when we were traveling, Secretary Kerry welcomed, in principle, the 72-hour uh, Eid uh, holiday yeah. uh, ceasefire. Uh, obviously, the United States would rather there was a nationwide permanent uh, cessation, but uh, that was what was on the table. However, it seems to have been breached, and today we have uh, reports that there's a rebel offensive underway to try and break the siege of Aleppo. So. Do you regard the the Syrian ceasefire as being in place, or has that gone now? And how was, what's the state date of the cessation that has obviously been partially on it up to now? Well, as you, as you rightly said, the regime extended it for an additional 72 hours, uh, uh, which was uh, ending today. Mm -hmm. um, but even as recently as yesterday, uh, Syrian regime forces continued to conduct ground and aerial operations in Aleppo in violation of both the nationwide cessation of hostilities, which was called for uh, in, in the UN Security Council resolution, but also the Eid period of calm, which they themselves announced. Um, we've also seen uh, disturbing reports of regime advances uh, in Daraya, which is a, a suburb of Damascus. That said, the cessation has largely held in other parts of the country, and we continue to urge all parties for complete compliance with the, na with the nationwide cessation of hostilities. The, uh, the regime needs to do, and we've said this before, Dave, they need to do what it committed to do, which is to end the indiscriminate use of weapons, including the targeting of civilians and civilian authorities, uh, and including medical ones. And we look to the Russians to make a, a greater use of the, uh, of the influence that we know that they have uh, to make that happen. Do you know whether the Russians were involved in the pro prolongation of 72 hours, or was that a Syrian? Uh, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know uh, the degree to which uh, they influenced the extension, um, but clearly there's not enough influence being applied or that influence is being ignored because we continue to see uh, uh, violations even shortly after they announced an extension. When was the last time Secretary Kerry spoke to Lavrov or anyone? Uh, I don't have an update for you since he spoke on the 5th of July. Okay. You Thank you. Can you expect the Secretary to discuss the new proposal with Russians on cooperation to focus on fighting ISIL and Jabhat al-Nusra? Well, as I said, um, we expect the discussions in uh, Moscow to range uh, across many issues. Syria will be front and center. There's no question about that. And. I, without getting ahead of an agenda uh, or discussions that haven't happened, I can assure you that um, one of the key topics that the Secretary is uh, going to want to uh, uh, cover uh, with Russian officials is uh, reduction in violence, the cessation of hostilities, getting that applied 
as it should have been applied nationwide in an enduring way, uh, a political transition, and of course, uh, you know, they will, I have no doubt that they'll continue to discuss uh, the humanitarian situation on the ground and the need for better and more sustained, more unimpeded access uh, to so many millions of Syrians in need. I fully expect that this will be front and center on the agenda, uh, and the Secretary will make clear uh, that, uh, uh, that we expect, as we have, uh, Russia to use the influence that we know it has uh, on the Assad regime um, to get the situation uh, in better control. Are you to Iraq? Sure. Thank you. So about the additional uh, 560 troops that Secretary Carter announced today, yeah. uh, did that come in response to a request from the Iraqi government, or was it uh, your assessment that you need to send these troops? I'm going to point you to what Secretary Carter said when he announced it, and he made it clear that this was done in full consultation uh, with uh, uh, Prime Minister Abadi's government in Baghdad. Uh, did, did they request it, or you thought like that there needs to be additional U.S. troops? It was done in full consultation and coordination with the Iraqi government. Uh, all of our uh, troops in Iraq are there at the invitation and the support of the Iraqi government. That won't change with this additional deployment. Uh, what do you say to critics who are saying this is uh, definitely mission creep uh, because uh, – uh, and what, what kind of role – I know you might follow me to the Pentagon what – what kind of role they might play in, 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 in the world? In the You're world right. I'm going to refer you to the Pentagon. But listen, it, it ain't mission creep if the mission ain't changing. And the mission's not changing in, in, in Iraq with respect to what – uh, U.S. troops are doing in a, a train, advise, and assist capacity, and then, of course, our airmen are, uh, are very much engaged in air operations, as they have been uh, inside the coalition. Yeah. On July 20, you'll be hosting a humanitarian pledging conference for Iraq. Yes, I announced it. Okay. <laughs> so there's an issue with the participation of the Kurdistan regional government that's in northern Iraq got a huge number of refugees that they're hosting, nearly two million. But generally, they don't get to attend these conferences because the U.S. leaves it up to Baghdad, whether to include the Kurdish representatives or not, and Baghdad doesn't include the Kurdish representatives. So my question is, this time, will you press Baghdad to make sure that representatives of the KRG included, are included? The British have done that in the past, and it's worked. Or alternatively, might you invite representatives of the Kurdistan regional government directly to attend this conference? Well, first of all, I want to talk about the importance of the conference, and the Secretary is very much uh, looking forward to it. It is – it's going to be an important gathering uh, for, an impor for an important purpose uh, uh, to uh, further encourage international community support uh, for the very real uh, – financial challenges that uh, that Iraq still faces as they are uh, uh, trying to enact reforms, political and economic, as they are uh, fighting um, a very lethal enemy still on their soil. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done on that day, and the Secretary uh, looks forward to rolling up his sleeves and getting at that work. Uh, I don't have an update for you on uh, invitations uh, or the process itself. Um, uh, the only thing I would say is that, uh, as we have made clear in the in the past, the the support that the United States is providing to Iraq in this time of great need is being done as it and it will continue to be done through the Abadi government in Baghdad. Um, uh, again, I will take the question for you in terms of. Uh, any more specificity on the invitation process? I just don't have that level of information right now. But I do want to stress that we continue uh, to manage uh, the support that we're providing through Baghdad. Well, it seems that given the critical role that the uh, Kurdish Peshmerga play in fighting ISIS and the great generosity that they've shown all these refugees and displaced persons, that they really merit the attention of the United States, and if they're not getting from Baghdad the, a reasonable share of this aid, that um, the United States should really consider stepping in and addressing this issue? Well, I, I, I would take issue with the notion that we haven't. Uh, I'm not going to get ahead of pledges or, or, 
or what size, scope, and character they're going to be, or or, or, or how they're going to be distributed inside a rock. But um, but you raise a good point, and one I, I neglected in my first in my first reply to you, and that's that we obviously recognize the service, the sacrifice, the courage, the bravery, the skill on the battlefield that the Peshmerga have demonstrated every single day, um, and. Uh, we're mindful of uh, the toll that this fight has taken uh, uh, up in the, the north um, and the significant role that the Kurdish regional government has played in terms of trying to deal with it as well. Um, that's why when you see Brett McGurk traveling to the region, uh, he, he never fails to, to stop in Erbil and have discussions uh, with uh, KRG representatives. Um, and so has, in fact, Secretary Kerry, on his most recent trip to Iraq, uh, made the effort to meet with him. Now, it was in Baghdad, but he made the effort to meet with him. Um, so we're mindful of that. We're mindful of the role they're playing um, and the skill that they are demonstrating. Uh, but I just won't get ahead of uh, specifics in terms of uh, pledging uh, contributions by any one state or how they might be distributed. Or invitations? Well, as I said, I will see if I can find out more information about uh, the invitation process, the protocol element of this. I don't know how much information I'm going to be able to provide uh, this far out, uh, but I'll take the question and we'll see what we can do in terms of getting you a better reply. Thank you very much. Yeah, Carol. John, do you have any reaction to the indictments in Tehran today of the three dual nationals, including an American and a Lebanese man who was working on contract with the State Department? I do, Carol. Uh, we've seen the reports of unspecified indictments announced by Iran against U.S. citizen Saimak Sim Namazi and uh, a U.S. legal permanent resident named Nizar Zaka, as well as other non-U.S. citizen dual nationals. As we've said before, we continue to believe that if the reports are true, both are being unjustly detained and should be released as soon as possible. We don't have any further information to provide on these announcements, and we're continuing to make all appropriate efforts on these cases and any other cases of U.S. citizens detained or missing in Iran. Are you taking it upon yourself to try to work for the release of the Lebanese citizen who is a resident of the United States? Well, again, um, you know, uh, we – for – privacy reasons, uh, Carol, we're not going to comment on efforts that we make on behalf of specific U.S. citizens uh, and legal permanent uh, residents overseas uh, without their written consent. What I can tell you is that we continue to use all the means at our disposal to advocate for U.S. citizens who need our assistance. That's really as far as I can go on that. Yeah. Uh, do you have a response to the uh, Japanese elections yesterday? Uh, the, 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 certainly we uh, uh, we saw the elections uh, and uh, uh, the preliminary results. I, I would refer you to Japanese authorities to speak to the, their elections. Uh, um, Japan is obviously a close friend and an ally um, uh, and certainly a democracy in their own right. Um, and uh, uh, we look forward to continuing that very close association, that very close friendship, that very close partnership, uh, and we'll continue to work with uh, uh, all the elected uh, members uh, in, in Japan's government, but I'm not going to make a characterization or a comment one way or the other uh, on an internal election. Specifically, um, sorry, sorry uh, one more. Just specifically, they um, uh, elected more than uh, two thirds of the ruling majority party, uh, which means that they could potentially uh, create changes to the pacifist constitution. Do you have any uh, comment on that? Uh, I, 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 I absolutely would not get ahead of of, of uh, issues like that. Um, as I said, uh, Japan is a close ally and a friend and a partner, and we look forward to continuing that very close association with them going forward. I'm not going to speculate one way or another about uh, policy changes that this election may or may not uh, infuse into the system. That that would be inappropriate at this time. So North Korea says they've uh, broken ties, uh, well, de facto ties that they had through the, the mission of the UN in New York to the United States. Uh, to what extent can you break that tie since it's a, it was informal, I understand, but uh, what's your reaction to that? I would say reaction is uh, essentially that, again, we call on North Korea to refrain from actions and rhetoric that only further raise tensions in the region. I'm not going to share the details of diplomatic exchanges one way or the other, um, uh, but um, 
uh, none of the rhetoric we've seen uh, of late is doing anything to increase security and stability on the peninsula. And the DPRK knows very well uh, what its international obligations are and should know very well what their obligations are to their own people uh, in, in terms of the, the, proper, uh, the proper kinds of decisions and choices uh, that they need to make going forward. Is there going to be, just on the same issue, is there going to be any negative consequences to not having that diplomatic channel, especially as uh, uh, military drills are scheduled for August? Well, again, I'm not going to um, get into the details of diplomatic exchanges one way or another. Uh, as you know, we, uh, you know, we don't have formal diplomatic relations uh, with, the, with the DPRK. And as for you know, their exercises, is that what you're referring the, the to? The joint U.S.-South Korean uh, exercises for uh, August, and September. And is there going to be, re there gonna be well, if an impact on that? Yeah, I mean, if there's no – that traditionally there's a rise of tensions uh, in advance and surrounding those, and if there's not a – a diplomatic channel uh, through New York, there's concerns uh, that that could make things even worse. Well, let me back up a little bit. First of all, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll point you to DOD to speak to specific training exercises, timing, scope, character. That's, that's not for us to speak to. But um, we, have a, we have significant security commitments uh, with the Republic of Korea, uh, alliance commitments that uh, we intend to continue to meet. And a key component of meeting those commitments is military readiness, and a key way to assure military ensure military re readiness is to exercise, is to train together. And uh, I can assure you that here at the State Department, we fully support efforts by the two militaries to do just that. And I don't see uh, any impact uh, on the requirements to stay military militarily ready. Uh, and therefore the obligations to train and to exercise going forward. Um, and I mean, given the threats, both rhetorically and actually, that have come from Pyongyang of late, um, uh, we certainly believe all the more strongly that uh, a proper readiness posture is warranted there uh, in the South. Okay. Yeah, let's stay in the region. Um, uh, do you have any concerns on uh, American detainees in North Korea? Uh, they said uh, that they would uh, um, treat them with wartime law. Yeah, uh, again, uh, we've seen the, the comments. Uh, again, um, not – I'm not going to – I'm not going to comment on every utterance that comes out of out of Pyongyang, but clearly um, rhetoric such as that obviously is not doing anything to uh, to ease tensions. Um, uh, as we've said before, the welfare uh, and safety of U.S. citizens abroad is one of the highest priorities of the State Department. Um, that's not going to change, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, we continue to call uh, on the North. Uh, to cease what is obviously uh, an improper and unjust detention uh, uh, of these individuals. Yeah. Can we stay in the region? Sure. South China Sea. Uh, I wonder if you have any uh, response to last Friday's uh, briefing you were asked about if the United States welcomed the remarks by <laughs> Philippines officials that they are open to discussions of a joint exploration of uh, resources in the South China Sea. Does the United States welcome it? The welcome the I'm sorry the welcome uh, the the uh, proposal by the Philippines that uh, they are willing they are open to discussion for a joint exploration of natural resources in the South China Sea with China. Uh, those are sovereign issues that uh, and decisions that uh, leaders of nations uh, are entitled, in fact, have a responsibility to make. Um, We've seen those comments, but again, this is a, th th these are issues for uh, the Philippines and China to discuss, um, and, uh, and uh, the United States isn't, doesn't have a, an official reaction uh, to those particular statements. Uh, with the ruling of tomorrow's Hague um, Tribunal coming up soon, um, do you think uh, is that open up opportunity for discussions for uh, joint resource management? 
I, 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 look, let's not get ahead of a tribunal decision that hasn't been rendered. Um, uh, we, our position has all along been that we want uh, all claimants to resolve disputes peacefully and in accordance with international law. We don't take a position on claims. We do take a position on coercion. Uh, we want these things resolved in, in accordance with uh, rule of law. Um, and, and as I said to your last question, if, if there are bilateral arrangements that can be had um, to do just that, um, short of having to take it to some, uh, uh, to, a, to a higher level, you know, then as long as it's done peacefully and in accordance with international law, the United States isn't going to uh, certainly interfere with that. But I just don't want to get ahead of a decision that hasn't been rendered. On your question on the, the Americans, I, I want to go back. There's one point I want to make that we continue to urge Pyongyang to adhere to its commitment to the Vienna Convention on consular relations and uh, grant consular access to any detained U.S. citizens without delay. I forgot to mention that and I wanted to put that in there, so I apologize for coming back to you. We still in the region? Yes? No? Okay, you both have your hands up. We'll go, you go first. Okay. Do U.S. officials plan to communicate with their Chinese counterpart after South China's arbitration result comes out tomorrow? Well, I, again, I'm not going to get ahead of, uh, uh, of, this, of this decision. Uh, uh, we need to see what the tribunal comes back with. Uh, as I've, that said, as I've said here from the podium, and as Secretary Kerry stressed in a recent conversation with Foreign Minister Wang Yi, uh, that uh, whatever the decision is, uh, we, uh, we urge all sides, all claimants, to show restraint, to show respect uh, for the rule of law, um, and to not allow, again, whatever this decision is, to not allow uh, 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 for increased tensions and increased uh, instability uh, in, in the South China Sea area. Is there any established uh, communication mechanism uh, between the U.S. and China to effectively control the possible possible conflicts caused by the arbitration? Well, it's not about controlling conflict. And you has, it, 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 there are many levels of communication that we have uh, with Chinese officials. DOD has um, uh, several in place uh, at various levels in the military chain of command. And of course, uh, the secretary uh, has a very forthright relationship with his counterpart. Um, and I suspect that that will continue. There are many ways in which we can communicate with China uh, uh, to affect our mutual interests in the region and around the world. Um, and it's in no one's interest to see the tensions in the South China Sea rise, uh, to see uh, insecurity fomented. Um, and uh, again, that was the message that the Secretary delivered in his conversation uh, just recently with the Foreign Minister, and it will, it will be consistently, it will be our message. I just, I'm not going to get ahead of, again, a, a decision that has been made yet. Okay? Yep. A uh, question about the Japan upper house election, and J Japanese Minister for Okinawa Affairs Shimajiri lost her upper house seat to challenge the uh, back it by the Okinawa governor and the coalition of the activists opposed to the Fudema relocation plan. So the Okinawa election result was the symbol that the people of Okinawa showed their will to oppose the Fudema relocation plan. So do you have any comment about the result of the Okinawa election? And does the U.S. state's government give up the current front of the relocation plan? Uh, again, I'm not going to comment on uh, in, uh, internal elections, which just occurred. Uh, I think I've addressed that in, in my previous answer. And on the Futenda replacement facility, as, as we've said, we will continue to work with the government of Japan uh, for uh, uh, the Futemna replacement facility uh, and that project and, and uh, moving forward with it. Um, uh, we're mindful, of course, of the concerns by many residents of Okinawa. We have been mindful of their concerns, uh, and that's not going to change. I can assure you Ambassador Kennedy is uh, engaged on this very closely. Um, but uh, we still believe that um, uh, moving forward on the replacement facility is in the best interest, not just of the U.S. military and, uh, and our security commitments in the region, but our security commitments to Japan, to the Japanese people. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, I, I, don't have, I don't have, nor would I expect, any changes to our commitment to that going forward. Yes? 
Okay, I wasn't looking at you, but that's okay. You've been patient. So we're going to go to him. I tell you, I'll go him, you, and then you. How's that? All right? Go Great. Ahead. And just following up on the earlier question. I Who mean, are you? Uh, Ryan Brown, CNN. Sorry. Okay. Uh, um, so just to go back to the earlier question about the Russian conversation, um, you mentioned a range of issues that they were going to talk about pertaining to Syria, but not specifically a potential military cooperation uh, on ISIS and al-Nusra. Well, we – first of all, there is no – uh, other than um, uh, a channel that has been opened up between DOD and the Russian military to deconflict for safety of operations purposes, uh, there is no U.S. military uh, coordination with uh, the Russian uh, military inside Syria. Uh, but the Secretary, as we said before, we continue to explore options and alternatives uh, and, and proposals. <laughs> Uh, 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 with respect to uh, the fight against Nusra and Daesh in Syria, and as I said, the degree to which the Russian military uh, uh, is willing to be committed to the fight against those two groups and exclusively those two groups, well, that's a conversation that we're willing to have. I just don't have any developments to speak to today, and obviously I wouldn't speak for the Defense Department anyway, but there's no military coordination going on now. Uh, we have and will continue to explore options and alternatives going forward to try to get the cessation of hostilities better applied and enforced, to try to increase pressure on Nusra and Daesh uh, across the country, uh, and again, all with an eye to trying to get out of political transition. Because as we've seen, prior talks between the opposition and the regime haven't gone so well, and one reason for that is that um, they were being bombed at the same time they were sitting down trying to have a a conversation about a political future. So we know that this is a key uh, component in terms of achieving any success on the political front. And I suspect that the Secretary will spend quite a bit of time in his discussions in Moscow on that on that issue. And then, uh, just quickly on Iraq, um, as the forces, a new set of U.S. troops are bound to go in and uh, they just recaptured a major base near Mosul, can you talk a little bit about kind of the Iraqi government's uh, vision for Mosul and, and kind of not necessarily a timeline, but how important politically is that for the Iraqi government under a body? Well, I'm loath to, to talk for another government, but I, I, I mean, broadly speaking, we all know how important Mosul is, and we've known that for quite some time. And there is an Iraqi uh, strategy. There is a, a campaign plan uh, to retake Mosul. It's their plan. Obviously, uh, the United States and coalition members will support as necessary, but it's their plan. It's their strategy. Uh, and they have to speak for it, and they have to, they have to execute it. And I think, as you heard uh, Secretary Carter uh, speak to today uh, out in Baghdad, that these additional troops, in part, will help with um, uh, logistical needs and logistical capabilities uh, in terms of uh, supporting uh, any future advances on, on Mosul. Uh, and the capture of Karaya, the base in Karaya, which is 40, 50 miles south of Mosul, that's an important, uh, uh, that's an important step uh, in the continued progress to retake Mosul. Uh, to restate your question, I certainly wouldn't speculate from here one way or another when that would happen or, ha or, or the manner in which it would, uh, would, uh, would, would begin uh, specifically uh, in terms of Mosul proper. but. We've said all along, and for many months now, that you know shaping operations uh, have already occurred uh, in terms of trying to soften up uh, dash positions uh, around Mosul. So this has been a continuing uh, process. This has been a continued focus of the coalition and of the Iraqi government, um, and uh, we're going to continue to look for ways to, to support them in their efforts to retake Mosul. Yeah. Thank you, John. I got Turkey-related questions today. I'm shocked. Uh, first I'm totally from, shocked. First from Syria, uh, Syria, Turkey. Uh, today, Turkish Prime Minister Binali Yildirim stated that there are actually not many reasons for Turkey to fight with Syria. On the opposite, actually, there are many reasons for Turkey to have good relations with Syria, which, assuming uh, uh, he intends to say Syrian regime, how do you see these uh, signs coming from Ankara that may be another rapprochement between uh, Ankara and the Damascus? Well, I'll let Turkish officials speak to those comments. Uh, I mean, I've seen them, but, you know, they should have to characterize uh, those comments. What I will say is 
Uh, Turkey is a NATO ally. Turkey is a key partner in the coalition. Turkey has been uh, cooperative and helpful with respect to going after Daesh inside Syria, um, uh, materially and, and in many other ways. Uh, they also uh, continue to have a, a very tough refugee problem on their side of the border, more than two million uh, that they are caring for and have done so nobly. And I would add that they are uh, con they continue to make efforts to shut down the flow of foreign fighters across their borders. So. Um, uh, Turkey's engaged. Turkey's involved. This isn't, as I said, it's not a theoretical exercise for them. It's real, and it's right uh, on their border. Um, uh, so we would look, for our part, for that cooperation uh, to continue. We would look for uh, Turkey to continue to contribute to, to, uh, to coalition efforts, and uh, we are in constant communication with Turkish officials about how to better affect that kind of coordination and how to better make those improvements and how to uh, improve the way uh, that together we're all going against a, a common enemy. Over the weekend, there was a news that one of the PKK leaders uh, got hit in northern Syria, which is within the Syrian uh, part of the uh, Kurdish part of Syria. Have you uh, had any kind of confirmation on that? Bahos Erdal is the name of the PKK leader. I do not. Okay, one uh, within Turkey just today. Human Rights Watch uh, released a report and saying that Turkey is blocking investigations demand uh, from UN, uh, United Nations Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights as well as from the human rights groups uh, into uh, the displacements and uh, the unlawful killings of civilians. These are the uh, alleged abuses that made by this, the Turkish uh, government within the last months, uh, which didn't, they, people put number about half a million Kurds within Turkey uh, forced to leave their uh, uh, places. Uh, do you have any comment on that one? Uh, we're only just now uh, uh, aware of uh, this human rights re report. We're working our way through it. I don't have, uh, you know, uh, uh, in specific opinions to render on any of these findings. Obviously, uh, uh, these are serious issues. These raise serious concerns. Um, but uh, until we've had a chance to go through the Human Rights Re uh, Watch report, it, it would be, uh, I think, imprudent for me to uh, comment one way or another with respect to the findings. Uh, obviously, in broadly speaking, uh, we take all allegations of mistreatment of uh, refugees or innocent civilians very, very seriously, um, and uh, uh, to the degree any any such charges are true, we'd like to see them fully investigated, fully and transparently investigated, and those uh, responsible will be held to account. Uh, but that's broadly speaking. I don't have um, specific things to address with this particular report. Final one. These allegations Are you about sure? the, the <laughs> yes. Okay. These allegations about the treatment of the Turkish government in the southeast of Turkey uh, have been going on for months, since last summer, and these questions have been asked to you many, many times. As I said, we take we take these kinds of allegations uh, very, very seriously. Uh, nobody wants to see those things occur, um, and we continue to urge. Uh, Turkey to fully investigate and to, and to examine these. Uh, but I, you know, you asked me a specific question about a report that just got issued. We're still working our way through that. But again, broadly speaking, we take this very, very seriously. You yeah, in the back there. Thank you. Kevin McAleese, South Africa Broadcasting. Um, I was just wondering if uh, you had any official comment on the charges that were brought by South African authorities uh, involving a plot to attack the uh, U.S. Embassy in Pretoria? So a couple of thoughts on that. Um, first of all, we applaud the work of the Directorate for Priority Crime Investigation, I guess otherwise known as the Hawks, in making these arrests. And we have full confidence in the South African judicial system to handle this case according to internationally accepted best practices for terrorism act, uh, cases. Excuse me. Um, I would refer you to South African authorities uh, for more details on their arrests. Just one more. Um, in light of this event, these suspects uh, were not only looking to attack the U.S. Embassy, but also to head to Syria to, to join ISIS. Are you concerned about the, the security level and measures in southern 
uh, Africa at the moment, especially in light of safety of U.S. citizens? Well, we're always concerned about the safety and security of our personnel and uh, our facilities and uh, American citizens uh, overseas. Um, I can tell you that we regularly engage uh, South African uh, authorities with respect to that. Um, as you know, we've, we've issued uh, uh, security messages in, in the past. We'll continue to do that as needed. And this is something we're constantly monitoring and we're constantly working with South African authorities on it. But uh, in general, of course, we're always concerned about that. Yeah. Uh, is there any comment on uh, Theresa May, who's poised to become the next Prime Minister of uh, Britain? We're, we look forward, as I said before, to working uh, uh, with ever, whoever uh, the, the next Prime Minister of, of Great Britain is. Uh, but Obviously, that decision is up to the British people. Yep. Uh, New York Times reported about two, hour, two hours ago that Indian authorities in Kashmir have killed about 30 people. Uh, is there any condemnation from the State Department with regard to this? Uh, these people have been killed in the last three days, and the numbers continue to rise. Yeah. Uh, we uh, also have seen reports of the clashes between protesters and Indian forces in Kashmir. Uh, obviously, we're concerned about the violence. We encourage all sides to make efforts uh, towards finding a peaceful resolution. Uh, this is really a matter for the government in, of India to speak to specifically, and I'd refer you to them for more comment. One more thing. Uh, a few months ago, I had asked you about the Duran Line issue, and you had uh, said that the U.S. recognized Duran Line as a permanent border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And then a few weeks ago, there were the uh, skirmishes between the Pakistani forces and the Afghan forces, and you gave a statement about that as well. But then there are uh, former ambassadors of U.S., such as Zalmay Khalidzad. He mentions in his book that the uh, uh, Duran line is a disputed territory. Uh, does the U.S. Uh... I'm not going to redraw the map today between <laughs> Afghanistan and Pakistan. I don't have anything additional to add to what we've said here. Because but look, broadly speaking, I'm not going to get into a topographical discussion with you today. Uh, we understand uh, that the border region uh, uh, is still safe haven for many terrorist groups. That's point one. Point two, we understand that the governments in Afghanistan and Pakistan know this themselves. Um, and have made efforts in the past to work together to try to address that threat. That's point two. Point three, we understand that that effort also has not always gone smoothly. Um, and we continue to urge those two governments to work together uh, uh, along that spine uh, to eliminate the safe haven that so many groups there uh, still enjoy. Because those groups are targeting both Afghan and Pakistani civilians. Innocent people that continue to die and be maimed uh, by these groups. So there's a shared interest there, uh, and that's what we're focused on. And we're not focused on lines on the map. We're focused on lines of effort to go after these groups by both governments. Okay. Can okay, we just move from the Duran line to Broadway? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Secretary of State uh, Kerry left the NATO summit earlier than. Uh, is uh, then the president or Secretary Carter or indeed Secretary Newland and many of the other principals from other NATO uh, allies. And then on Saturday night, he attended a production of Hamilton on Broadway. Did he leave early to go to the theater? Well, a couple of things on this, Dave. Um, I think, number one, it's important to note that he had a very full schedule, very comprehensive agenda uh, in Warsaw, actually the entire week, but certainly at Warsaw. Um, and he completed all his commitments at the Warsaw Summit before departing, each and every one of them. Um, and no event uh, that happened the day following uh, involved uh, leaders at the foreign minister level. It was a heads. Of, it was a head of. It was a heads of state uh, day, basically uh, 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 of topics. So um, he worked very hard in Warsaw. He completed all. Uh, the meetings and uh, discussions that he had intended to complete. Um, and, but yes, he did depart uh, before the president, and he departed uh, because uh, he had uh, committed to attend the wedding of the son of a very dear, close, personal friend of his uh, back in New England. That is the reason why uh, uh, he, he left Warsaw a little early. But again, I would stress that 
uh, uh, even if he had stayed, he, will, he would have already completed his entire agenda. Uh, so I think press reporting uh, and speculation out there that he, that he uh, left Warsaw uh, to attend a play is just patently false. But, uh, but the play didn't appear on his public schedule. He did go to uh, the musical on Saturday night. That, that is a fact. He, 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 he did uh, uh, as a private endeavor, something that he wanted to do with his daughter. Uh, so he did attend. Um, but that had nothing to do with his Warsaw agenda whatsoever. And it had no effect whatsoever uh, on the work that he was able to get done in Warsaw. Secretary Clinton's email server. Um, has the State Department started the process of reviewing the security clearances of former secretaries of State Clinton's um, aides? There's, a, I think, a little bit of a flaw in your question. The, the internal review that we are going to conduct is not about reviewing uh, security clearances. It's about reviewing uh, the specific handling of sensitive, sensitive and classified information, as we said we would uh, a few months ago. Um, so we're now going to um, start that effort now that the FBI has completed their investigation. There are and could be administrative outcomes as a result of this review, but I'm not going to prejudge that or get ahead of it. Um, we are still, as I talked about Friday, uh, we are still uh, organizing the effort uh, in, in terms of uh, scope and character. Um, and I just don't have an update for you today on that. Um, I'm sure you're aware that today, in addition to the proposed legislation from the Senate, some members of Congress have also uh, of the House have also introduced legislation to revoke the security clearances of Clinton's aides. Um, I know you, you just mentioned that there could be administrative actions, but is the State Department looking at similar actions like the legislation? Well, again, that, I'm, that question gets to the review itself, which which hasn't begun. I mean, we're still organizing the effort. Um, and the review will be, it's all about looking at the degree to which information was classified at the time it was sent and then the handling of it. As a result of this, as I said before, there are um, numerous uh, administrative outcomes that could occur. Uh, and some of those outcomes could affect security clearances. But again, I don't want to speculate because we haven't begun the work. Um, so, and I'm certainly not going to talk about proposed legislation. Uh, I'm aware of it, but I'm not going to, that, that's for members of Congress to speak to. Our focus, and where Secretary Kerry wants the State Department focus, is on conducting this review uh, in an efficient, effective, as expedition, expeditious po as possible manner. Um, and, um, you know, when we get to the end and, and, uh, and, and, uh, we can share information with you. We will. We'll try to be as transparent as possible. But as I also said last week, there's going to be some legal uh, uh, restraints, most likely, on, on the, the level of specificity that we can go into because this is an administrative, not a criminal process. Okay. Do you know of a situation where a State Department employee, employee or a DOD employee has kept their security clearance if they were exercising extreme carelessness and handling classified information? What I can tell you is we take uh, the handling of classified and sensitive information very seriously here. You've heard me say that even in recent days. Uh, it's something that, uh, that we're always trying to improve. We're certainly open to uh, ideas and efforts uh, to do just that. Um, I, don't have the, I, I don't have the litany of history here in front of me in terms of um, the degree to which people have been impacted in that way uh, as a result of not handling things well. But again, um, we're not going to prejudge outcomes here. We're going to do this review fairly and efficiently and effectively. We're going to focus on doing it the right way, uh, and then we'll, we'll let what is learned guide uh, decisions and recommendations going forward. I'm just not going to get ahead of that. Okay, thanks, everybody. Have a great day.